that very same molecule that makes cat pee smell so catty is found in trace quantities in uh, some of the finest wines in the world. And in fact, give what is often described by wine tasters as a slightly catty animal quality to the wine, which because it's there just in trace amounts, intrigues us rather than repelling us. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. This is Kobo in Conversation. My guest is the award-winning science writer Harold McGee, author of the new book Nosedive, a field guide to the world's smells, a wondrous and entertaining guide to the smells of food, yes, but also of our surroundings, indoor as well as outdoor, from rotten eggs and wet dogs to coffee and perfume and it offers readers a whiff of the very building blocks of the universe itself. Harold McGee, welcome to Kobo. Thank you, Michael. Wonderful to be here. I encountered the book that you're best known for on food and cooking because the first person that I lived with was studying to be a chef. and She would come home with cookbooks, you know, big ones like La Rousse Pratique or historical cookbooks by Escoffier. And those made sense because, you know, cooks need recipes. But one day she came home with a book that could best be described as kind of a blue brick, you know, 700 pages, <laughs> teal cover. <laughs> it, it wasn't a cookbook. It didn't have any recipes. But she said it was the book that her instructors referred to more than any other book that they were assigned. And the way she described it, cookbooks were about how. On Food and Cooking was about why. And why for everything. Why bread rises. Why meat browns. And why that's a good thing. Why salt enhances flavor. What's going on that makes stuff into food. And and what I can say is that except for the time that she brought home a live blue crab and left it loose in the fridge, it was, for me, the most life-altering thing that she brought home from <laughs> from the kitchens. <laughs> so before we get into your latest book, Nosedive, I'd love to rewind a bit and talk about being a literature and writing professor at Yale in the 1980s and how you ended up writing what is still the definitive book on the science of food and cooking. Well... It was an accident, <laughs> uh, as uh, a lot of good things in life are. So, yes, I was uh, at Yale teaching literature, wanting to do that for my career, but jobs were scarce. And uh, so after doing it for a couple of years and not having much luck on the job market, my uh, faculty advisors uh, suggested that I maybe do something with a part of my life that I thought I'd left behind, which is science. So I started out uh, at a university going to Caltech and studying astronomy, and then for a variety of reasons, shifted to philosophy and then to literature. Um, they said, you know, uh, not a lot of people have that science in their background, so why don't you do something with that? And uh, so I I had been teaching writing at Yale, among other things. And so I thought, well, yeah, maybe I can take advantage of what I've learned about writing and uh, what's in my deep past, but uh, always an abiding interest in science and do something with that. And long story short, I had friends who were interested in getting together at potlucks and uh, learning about wine and enjoying food and um one thing led to another. We would ask each other questions. Questions uh, sometimes were, uh, for example, why is it that beans give you gas? <laughs> I had a friend from New Orleans who loved red beans and rice and could never eat as much as he actually wanted to. And uh, so these fun questions would come up. I would go to the library, having nothing better to do, and uh, and discovered that there are answers to a lot of these questions. And so one thing led to another, and I ended up writing about food. <laughs> but it, but didn't just write a little bit about food. You know, wrote about almost every you know chemical process, every um, you know every transformation that happens as we make things that we can eat, how 
how wide ranging was the, the 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 process of research of accumulating that knowledge so that you could put the book together? Well, uh, you know, I was a, a literature uh, student and then professor, and so. I was used to spending a lot of time in the library, you know, in the stacks, looking at uh, old uh, books and journals and so on. And that's actually a part of it that I really enjoyed a lot and which unfortunately is no longer really what I do, which was to say to go to the library and open books that people hadn't opened for who knows how long and find little nuggets of fascinating information that, uh, that have been forgotten. So uh, the first time around in the 1970s is when I actually started, uh, I had to go to physical libraries and carry a stack of volumes to a table and just plow through them looking for the information that I was in search of. And uh, again, being a, uh, a teacher, that's, that's not something that bothered me. I really enjoyed it. And were you conscious at the time that this this was something that was missing from the bookshelf, that there wasn't a book that addressed all of those topics. Yes, in fact, that's uh, that was the whole idea. I was looking for a niche. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I had started out in science in astronomy. And so I, my first thought was, well, I'll write about astronomy. But then, you know, there were very good people already writing about astronomy. When did you get a sense that that, that book was something that was making a difference for people who were you know, not just scholars or interested in science, but who were working in kitchens, who were preparing food? Well, you know, my initial idea was that I was writing it not for um, scientists, but for people like my friends and myself who were kind of amateur cooks, didn't do it for a living, and therefore didn't know as much as the pros did and needed all the help we could get. <laughs> and I actually assumed that the professionals knew plenty already they really didn't need to know the stuff that i included in the book because they had learned by practice they were apprentices they'd worked their way up they'd cooked these things thousands of times and so they had that knowledge in their fingertips but then uh, at a certain point uh, i'd say maybe five years after the book came out i started to hear from uh, culinary students, not not chefs. In fact, the, the few encounters I had with chefs, they were very condescending. Uh, but the students really wanted to know what was going on because like my friends and myself, they were just kind of getting into it and they wanted to kind of shortcut the apprenticeship to you know, not 10 years, but maybe 10 months. And uh, so understanding things was really important to them. And that's when I really realized that it was going to be useful to uh, to people in the profession as well as outside. After On Food and Cooking, you wrote several more books. You taught at the Culinary Institute of America and elsewhere. You were a columnist for the New York Times. And then in 2010, Two things happen. You become a visiting lecturer at Harvard, and you start working on a new book that became Nosedive, A Field Guide to the World Smells. But my understanding is it didn't start as being about smells. What was the plan for that book at its inception? Well, uh, from the very beginning, I'd been interested in understanding flavor. Because uh, to me, not as a professional, but as someone who loves to eat, that was the most important thing about food was the, the pleasure that we get from its qualities. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, we didn't know a whole lot about, uh, about the experience of flavor, either what was in the foods that gave rise to flavor or what happens in our bodies to register um, those flavors. So uh, it had always been back of my mind to do something about that. And then come 2010, we had actually, uh, over those decades, learned a lot. And I thought, okay, now's my chance. I'll devote a whole book just to the subject of uh, the flavors of food and drink. But then along the way, I got uh, sidetracked. And I got sidetracked because the more I learned about uh, flavor, the more I realized that the sensations that we enjoy in food and drink are actually sensations that other things in the world give us. And I was intrigued by that 
um, kind of crosstalk. You know, why is it that um, something that we put in our mouths can remind us of something that we would never dream of putting in our mouths? Uh, and uh, that led me to ask, why do all the things in the world that I could think of have the smells that they do? And I, I chose to focus on smells essentially because taste of the two senses that are involved in flavor, taste and smell, taste is pretty much limited to a half, half dozen sensations. It's smell that gives us the tremendous variety of flavors. And so smell is what I focused on and smells of the world, not just food. And can you talk a little bit more about that relationship between taste and smell? You know, we know they interact. We know that they're connected. But how closely tied are they? They're very closely tied together uh, in the brain. So, you know, we uh, are taste detectors are on our tongue and our smell detectors are in our nose. So they're pretty far apart from each other, but they come together in the brain and the brain knits them together into an overall perception. Uh, you know, the, the brain is not really interested, at least uh, from the beginning, in dissecting experiences into their component parts. It's interested in putting the information together into an overall impression, which then tells us, are we in a good situation or a not so good situation? And then how should we respond? So the, the brain actually puts taste and smell together in such a way that we actually, um, if we're asked for uh, where it is in our body, we're experiencing the aroma of a food as we eat, we say it's in the mouth, even though we're actually detecting the molecules in our nose. So that's how tightly they're they're pulled together in the brain. For people who pick this book up, one thing I would recommend is to read the introduction. Some books you can skip, um, but not this one. From the introduction, I learned just how different our sense of smell is from the rest of our senses, which I, I guess I knew intuitively, but in that you know I have all five senses and they all seem to operate, but I'd never really thought about how different smell was uh, kind of, you know, experientially and neurologically from the rest of the senses we have. Can you talk a little bit about how smell fits in with the rest of our senses and what its role is and why that makes smell so much different? Yeah, well, uh, so our lives are dominated by uh, sight and hearing. For most of us who have um, uh, sight and hearing systems that, that work properly, they're, they just dominate our lives. Um, but if you think about what it is that we're actually experiencing when we see something or when we hear something, it's actually a very indirect contact with whatever it is that's causing that sensation. So in the case of uh, sight, we're seeing light that's being reflected from an object. And in the case of hearing, we're detecting pressure waves in the air that are being emanated from an object that's moving and causing those air waves. But in the case of smell, we're actually detecting the little bits of the things that are around us directly. So when we smell something, we're detecting uh, what, what happens is that little bits of that thing, say a piece of cheese, um, little molecules from that piece of cheese are actually escaping from the surface of the cheese, flying through the air. We're sniffing them up into our nose, and it's there that they uh, uh, react with our smell detectors, our olfactory receptors, and then the receptors send that information to the brain. So unlike the, the other senses, it's actually, the smell is actually a, a direct, intimate, uh, impression of and contact with the material world around us. It also has in common with hearing that it's you know, ambient rather than directed. You know, it's a it's about the environment that we're in in all directions rather than something we you know we kind of point and direct and focus. I was also interested. In, in something that you'd mentioned, that our description of smells is something that has evolved over time. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Greek or Chinese or Indian natural philosophers 
described what they were smelling or had what their vocabulary was for smelling? Well, uh, it's it's very true that um, uh, the, the way we communicate about the experience of smell, which, which is such a, an intimate uh, sensation, you know, with, with sight, we can point to something and say, see that, that, and then we can agree on what we're seeing. But as you say, in the case of smell, it's something in the air, it's invisible. And we're, uh, we're trying to describe what it is that we're experiencing to someone else who's trying to understand what we're experiencing. So, uh, the, the vocabularies that cultures have used depend very much on, the the experiences that are important to those cultures and they're usually fairly limited um, until fairly recently um, to uh, essentially pleasant and unpleasant uh, is it a good smell or is it not a good smell and then you might subdivide those two categories into um, you know this is rotting or this is um, uh, you know, leftovers that have been sitting around too long or whatever it might be. Uh, but it would still be a, a pretty basic set of descriptions based on the objects that we associate those smells with. Nowadays, um, thanks to, well, all kinds of de developments, uh, we have a much more, um, how should we say, uh, populated <laughs> this, uh, vocabulary for smells. So many different details. All you have to do is read a uh, a uh, description in a newspaper or magazine of a wine or a, a particular dish at a restaurant that somebody enjoyed, and you can see how uh, detailed we can be these days when we when we pay attention to the details of the experience. You also write that smell is something that relies a lot on prior experience. You know, with sight, if I see a flamingo for the first time. I can describe it without ever having seen one before. But it sounds like smell works differently in our brains when we encounter a new smell for the first time. Can we talk a little bit about lemongrass and ginger and ants? <laughs> yes, that's a, a wonderful example of how experience determines how it is that we experience uh, uh, new new flavors so i was very lucky years ago to attend a talk by a brazilian chef named alex atala who has done a lot of work um, exploring the the foods of the uh, amazon region and in the amazon region uh one of the more prolific uh creatures that can be consumed as food uh uh, is uh, several different uh, varieties, actually, of ants. And they make soups with them, they make uh, sauces with them, and so on. And Alex recognized that they had a, uh, a very particular flavor, which he knew, not from ants, because he'd never had ants before, but from spices, from, uh, uh, from Asian products that had never appeared in the Amazon, ginger and lemongrass. And so uh, he would he would bring uh, as a, a lesson to all of us um, samples of ants to lectures that he would give and have us taste them and describe them uh, and say yes these these are surprisingly good they taste of uh, of these uh, wonderful Asian spices and then he would tell the story of going to the Amazon bringing with him lemongrass and ginger and presenting them to his hosts in the Amazon and asking them what they thought of the spices. And they would say, oh yes, these are very nice. They taste like ants. So it, it just depends entirely on, uh, on our prior experience and our associations um, in a way that, as you say, is not the case with sight and with hearing because we can describe what it is that we see and hear in much more general terms. But when it comes to aromas, uh, we, we always describe them in terms of the objects that we associate those aromas with. Does that mean that the more things we taste or the more things that we've had the opportunity to ex sort of experience in either taste or smell, um, then means we're capable of detecting greater gradations in taste or smell? 
Yes, uh, and that's that's the whole idea behind um, uh, learning to taste wine, or in the case of perfumery, uh, learning the the thousands of aromas that go into uh, commercial perfumes. In fact, uh, I mentioned in the book uh, a study by a, a sociologist of science who said that you know when you when you train as a perfumer and you learn these many many hundreds of different uh, molecules and what they can provide to a perfume, you're really actually creating your nose. You're, uh, you're making it capable of perceiving things that before you started training it, you would never have been able to perceive or to distinguish. So it really is true that the, the more attention you pay to the experience of smelling, uh, the more you're able to distinguish gradations to to recognize things that you wouldn't have been able to recognize before and get much more out of the experience. When you were going through the process of creating this book, was that something that you were conscious of you know, as you were sort of working away on the chemistry and the you know, the botany and you know, all of the different components that make up this book? Did you find yourself paying more attention to smells and scents in a different way yes <laughs> uh, i just got uh, sucked in uh, the way i did with the subject of food back in the 1970s uh, because it is so fascinating and because uh, you know uh, for example um, until i started writing this book to me flowers smelled like flowers uh, but then when i began to study about the aromas in flowers and their function in, you know, pollination and that kind of thing, uh, I beg began to enjoy the differences between, you know, roses and narcissus and uh, gladioli and, you know, the, the range of aromas, um, uh, even within a particular category. You know, I, I devote several pages to the rose family simply because there are thousands of different varieties that have been selected in China and in Europe and the Middle East, all for different qualities. And if you, if you pay attention, you can, you can get them, you can experience them and then try to imagine, you know, what, what was the role of that particular sensation in the culture that cultivated them? I'm going to come back to plants in a minute, but first you take us all the way back to oh, the formation of the universe to help us understand that at its most fundamental level, even space has smells. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, well, I mentioned that I uh, started out in astronomy. <laughs> and so this was, uh, in a way, my my returning to those days, my fascination with the night sky and trying to understand what's going on up there and our place in, in the universe. And the question occurred to me as I started to write about aromas, um, when would it have been in the history of the universe that aromas that we would recognize would first have appeared in the cosmos? So if we, if we had noses as kind of cosmic beings and could fly through space and uh, sample the aromas of empty space, when would we first start to notice things that would be familiar to, to life on Earth? And the answer turned out to be very, very early, because once the the basic elements, chemical elements are created, they just tend to hang out with each other and react with each other and bond to each other in certain ways. And here on Earth, life has taken advantage of those predilections among the elements to uh, to build on them and for their own purposes. So it turns out that there are very familiar smells up there which uh, radio astronomers have been able to detect things like the smell of um, of cooked eggs hydrogen sulfide um, ammonia uh, uh, alcohol ethanol uh, lots of things that are very familiar to us um, and that are relatively small molecules so you don't you don't you don't need a lot of collisions up in space for these things to come together and once they do because they are primeval molecules in a sense even if they're created anew here on earth uh, they tend to have a kind of primeval 
uh, harsh quality to them that the the aroma of, for example of a flower which is very carefully crafted by the flower uh, uh, a very different kind of um, quality we get introduced to the smellscape of the earth before and just after life begins to emerge uh, the sulfur-based chemicals that would have made the earth the early earth a very harsh and not very good smelling place to be but then comes what I had not been introduced to before, the great oxygenation event, which sounds literally like a breath of fresh air, um, but also is a, a, a time of cataclysmic extinction. The primeval Earth was um, rocky and, and had a lot of water on it and had in its atmosphere not a whole lot except uh, nitrogen. And methane, and, and you know things that are uh, belched up out of volcanoes. Nothing much that that would uh, support us. But the creatures, the, the first creatures to evolve on the Earth, evolved in that environment, and therefore were at home and comfortable in that environment, and made do with whatever was available to them. Uh, it turns out that uh, once those early creatures uh, recognized the usefulness of oxygen and found a way to extract it from water and uh, and then do various biochemical chemical things with it, uh, they had a great advantage over those first uh, generations of microbes. And so the microbes that somehow knew how to work with oxygen began to proliferate. And in the process, they uh, released a lot of oxygen into the atmosphere. They were getting it out of water. They were getting it out of carbon dioxide and uh, putting it as is, as uh, oxygen itself, into the oceans. Once the oceans were uh, saturated, it began to get into the atmosphere. And that uh, changed things for the microbes that had grown up in the absence of oxygen, because oxygen is a very powerful molecule. Uh, if you don't know how to handle it, it'll kill you. And so it killed off most of those first generations of, uh, of microbes, but some survived. And those are the microbes that we find today in uh, environments that are relatively oxygen free, including our own insides. So it turns out that, um, you know, in our gut, there is not much oxygen. So there are microbes there that, that thrive uh, exactly because of its absence, and uh, they help flavor our lives as well. <laughs> One thing that became clear, you know, as you're, um, as you're describing the early Earth, certainly also clear when you're reading on food and cooking is that to, to talk about cooking and taste is to talk about chemistry. But it is somehow even more true about smell uh, and about your current book. You know, we're talking about individual molecules, their shape and their structure and how we detect them. And, and so I'm wondering if that was something that you had to grapple with a bit as you were putting this book together. How, how much chemistry goes in? How much do I, do I put in front of the reader so that they understand what's going on under their noses? Yes, uh, that, that was a, a huge issue. And in fact, my publisher and I had uh, extensive discussion. Uh, productive, spirited discussions? <laughs> <laughs> yes. In the end, yes. <laughs> um, because you're right, the, the subject of the book, when you come right down to it, is molecules, is chemicals. And that's a subject that most people are not terribly comfortable with. And in fact, I wasn't that comfortable with it. You know, I was used to talking about classes of molecules like proteins and the way that they behave when we cook meat. But specific molecules like ionone or, you know, terpenes, uh, not so much. I had to learn on the job. And what I tried to do with that experience of learning on the job is find, try to find a way to present it to people reading the book so that they could kind of learn in the process of reading the book. 
So I started with the simplest molecules and then kind of followed through the evolution of life on Earth, the, the gradual complexification of the smells and also the, the you know, early smells, not so nice. Uh, complex smells much, much nicer. Um, so to, to try to make that point and, and also just to take the, the fear out of dealing with the idea of molecules and chemicals, because when you get right down to it, they're, they're little things and we're experiencing them all the time and we're made of them. So why not get to know them at least a little bit as these uh, caricatures, these little cartoons that uh, that represent their different uh, shapes. Well, and that was the thing that that surprised me about the experience of reading the book was, you know, you're very good at introducing some chemical concepts, which is you know, not something you get introduced to a lot in you know in regular reading, but but through some repetition and through the examples that you tie them to and the the real world sense that they. Um, uh, that they generate, it, yeah, you start to get familiar with you know, with chemicals over time, and imagine them in your world. Something that came up repeatedly um, was the central role of carbon um, all the way through the book, and you know what I've come to believe is the sexiest and most promiscuous of all of the elements, thanks to your <laughs> thanks to your writing. <laughs> Tell us why carbon is so important in what we smell. Yeah, well, pretty much everything that we smell uh, is a molecule based on carbon. A handful of, of exceptions, but they tend to be those, you know, really primeval, uh, not so nice things. Um, so carbon is is essentially what made us. And carbon is uh, remarkable among the elements in um, wanting to bond with itself and wanting to bond with other elements. It's, it's uh, as you say, promiscuous. It's, uh, it's um, uh, just eager to make structures in a way that other elements simply aren't. And so life has taken advantage of that to make, uh, to start with, you know, very simple molecules like methane or carbon dioxide, which is just one carbon atom attached to a couple of other things. Um, our, the molecules in our bodies are chains of hundreds to thousands of carbon atoms with various decorations on them that um, we've, or our, our uh, ancestors figured out how to put together into structures that allow us to move and to breathe and to do all the things that living things do. So it's, it's really uh, uh, difficult to imagine complex life uh well i would say complex chemical structures and therefore life uh in the absence of carbon there just aren't any other elements like it you describe what you call the carbon starter set of smells and it's a a dizzying chapter that shows how these very subtle variations in the configuration of a molecule can create radically different smells. Can you give a couple of examples of how a bit of carbon here or there changes completely what it is that you'd smell? Well, you know, to take uh, just two carbon molecule, um, ethanol, so that's alcohol, it smells like alcohol, has um, a, uh, an oxygen and a hydrogen attached to it and a few other hydrogens as well. But if you change one side group and just add a little bit to that last carbon so that it's not just a, uh, an oxygen hydrogen group, then you end up with uh, something called acetaldehyde, which smells like green apples. So you go from a molecule that smells like uh, you know hospital disinfectant or a bad vodka on the one hand uh, to something that smells fruity. And then if you simply add an addition, uh, another carbon, so it's three rather than two or four or five or six, all the way up to the, the limit for our ability to smell things is maybe around 15 carbon atoms long. Otherwise, they're too heavy to, to fly through the air. But uh, the possibilities are, are literally endless. And uh, 
and life has taken advantage of many of those possibilities. After you lay a foundation of the chemical components of smell, we spend the middle part of the book in the natural world. And it, and you can summarize it something like, plants smell better than animals, and dead plants smell way better than dead animals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It may seem like a bit of a broad question, but why is that? Well, it, it really comes down to uh, the different lives that plants and animals live. Um, and I think this is you know, just one of the wonderful things about um, uh, experiencing the natural world in this way, because then you can begin to, you know, look at plants and animals and just see how, uh, how they've adapted to surviving on this planet. So in the case of animals, um, they uh, essentially, all of them run around to find food that they can uh, ingest to uh, to survive, to um, uh, to have the energy to live and then to reproduce themselves. They can't make their own food, and so they need to find other foods. And so most animals um, are built up out of molecules that help them move. Um, and those molecules are proteins, and proteins have a lot of nitrogen and sulfur atoms in them. They rely on those two elements uh very importantly plants are very different they're stuck in one place and um they don't run around they can make their own food they don't rely on other creatures um but they have to defend themselves against other creatures and so instead of relying on proteins and a lot of nitrogen and sulfur they rely on these ever more complex carbon chains uh that are uh, structurally defensive and also chemically defensive. They make chemical weapons to ward off uh, animals. And so uh, a, a piece of, um, well, a, an animal that has now deceased and uh, is no longer maintaining itself, well, those nitrogen and sulfur atoms get turned into molecules that are tending toward, again, the primeval and the unpleasant and nasty. And for us, they are indicators of decay and death. Uh, whereas plants, if, if they fall over, um, they don't have those same uh, proteins, the, the same numbers of nitrogen and sulfur atoms. And so uh, they smell like um, leaves in the gutter, which is not an unpleasant smell. You also do, and I have to say, I was not expecting this, a fairly in-depth analysis of cat pee. Why is, <laughs> why is cat urine so distinctive? <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, the reason I paid attention to it is, is both that it's distinctive and that there are foods that smell like cat pee. Uh, for their own reasons. Um, so cat pee is distinctive because the cat actually makes a set of molecules, and this is the tomcat, not the female of the species, makes a set of molecules that once those molecules are released into the environment by way of urine, uh, those molecules are transformed into very strong smelling uh, molecules containing sulfur, uh, that uh, get the attention of other cats, both to mark territory and say, this is mine, uh, don't come here, uh, but also to attract um, uh, female cats to let them know, please do come here, I'm here. <laughs> uh, so it, it's a, a signal, signaling system that's very important to that particular species. And then it turns out, that that very same molecule that makes the cat pee smell so catty uh, is found in trace quantities in uh, some of the finest wines in the in the world um, and in fact give what is often described by wine tasters as a slightly catty uh, animal quality to the wine which because it's there just in trace amounts intrigues us rather than repelling us and that's that's something that comes up repeatedly through the book is this you know, this idea that 
a kind of like amplitude and quantity is uh, um, is something that can pivot a smell from you know from repulsive to appealing, um, just depending on its concentration and how we encounter it. That's right. Uh, my favorite example of that is uh, indole in flowers. So indole is a nitrogen containing compound. It's found in decaying um, animal flesh and um, uh, um, remains of various kinds, but it's also present in trace quantities in um, uh, flowers of the Narcissus family uh, and gives those flowers a very specific um, uh, je ne sais quoi. Uh, it's a, you know, a, a note that really distinguishes that that set of flowers, that family of flowers. Um, some people can't stand it. Um, other people love it, but it, it certainly marks them as uh, as their own group. Speaking of groups, yeah, we're animals too. So we're we're in the mix of your your tour through the natural world. Uh, people in different parts of the world smell different, and I think you know, we've kind of heard bits and pieces and historical yeah sort of anecdotes about that but i had always thought that it was because of environment or it was because of what people ate but um one of the things that you describe is that our scent has something to do with our genetics yeah you know, we smell different because um of our own composition that's right uh, we're in a way not that different from the tomcat uh, marking its territory with very particular molecules. So we are animals as well. And we've, um, uh, at, at some point in our evolutionary history, it was important for our bodies to give information to uh, others in our social group about who we were uh, and our, our health status, our uh, reproductive status, all kinds of information important to uh, animal life. And we still have some of those qualities sticking with us, even though smell is much less important in everyday life today. Uh, and one of the things that we do is um, uh, essentially what the cat does. We secrete in our sweat molecules that, um, uh, that when they reach the surface of our bodies are broken apart by the microbes that live on our bodies, the, the skin microbiome. And that releases a, again, a sulfur containing molecule and, and actually various um, distinctive molecules that, um, that we notice uh, these days as body odor. Uh, and the more of those molecules that we release, um, the, the stronger that odor is. And it turns out that, as you say, we're uh, different genetically from region to region in the world. And there are certain parts of the world where we release or people there release uh, large quantities of these uh, odorous molecules and other areas where we release much less. Um, so uh, Europe... Uh, Africa, we tend to release large quantities of these molecules that can then become odorous. Uh, in Asia, much, much less. And that's been noticed historically, and now we understand it uh, in evolutionary terms. You also explore what you call chosen smells, incense, perfume, tobacco. Perfume alone has been the subject of whole books. Among the many things I didn't know about perfumes was that while many perfumes use fragrances drawn from nature, um, you say, you've said that the more lifelike the smell, you know, the more that it resembles its original plant or its natural source, often the more technology and science is involved in in creating that smell in the first place. That giving that sort of pure transmission of a smell is often a very difficult and complicated task. That's right, because uh, perfumes are essentially made by um, extracting aromas 
from natural things. But that process of extraction changes the aromas. Um, if you just think of a, a flower uh, in a vase on your uh, tabletop, you sniff it, it, the flower is alive and it's releasing those molecules uh, even as you smell it. If you then try to take that flower and extract its essence, you kill it and uh, you treat it in ways that um, change its chemistry so that at the end of the process, you may end up with an extract, an essence that is the essence of a rose, for example, but it really doesn't smell like the fresh rose anymore. It smell it has its own very interesting, wonderful smell, but it's not the same as the the living rose. And so, perfumers today are able to analyze the molecules coming out of a living rose, and then synthesize those molecules and make them into an artificial perfume that's actually much closer to the living rose than the extract from the living rose. I can't talk about perfume without taking at least a moment to talk about the most bizarre substance in the olfactory world. Tell me about ambergris. Well, it is a remarkable material. So you start with a, a whale, uh, huge creatures swimming in the ocean, uh, whose diet is largely giant squid. So they consume tons and tons of squid. Uh, they digest most of the squid, but not all of the squid is digestible. And so they end up with deposits inside them of various squid debris, uh, and including the, the beaks, which are sharp and, um, and just not digestible at all. Uh, depending on the animal, you may or may not end up with a, a large deposit of this material uh, that just simply can't be excreted by the whale during its lifetime. So when it dies, that large mass uh, uh, persists, uh, ends up in the ocean, and then will float around for, uh, in some cases, decades, maybe even longer than that. It's difficult to, to analyze. And it turns out that the combination of squid remains and a whale's digestive system, when uh, bobbing around in the ocean for years to decades to many decades, uh, becomes transformed into a waxy material that um, had started out as smelling like squid, but now smells uh, ethereal. It smells completely different. And it's the result of um, enzymes that survive from the whale's intestinal system and the materials themselves, those long carbon chains that we've been talking about that end up becoming transformed and uh, transfigured <laughs> into something that is now one of the most valuable um, perfume materials on the planet because you, you can't just make it, you have to find it. And what does it what does it get used for? Why is it so important to the perfumer's art? Well, it it first of all has an aroma that is just unique. It's it's like nothing else, um, and it's hard to describe because, as we were saying before, if if uh, if a smell is associated with an object, that's how we describe it. Uh, I can only describe it as ambergris like. <laughs> Uh, but very rich and um, um, uh, fatty in a good sense. Uh, that's, the, that's the quality I try to cover by using the word rich. Mm -hmm. But then the other thing about it is that in perfumery, it acts as a fixative. So if you add a little bit of ambergris to a, a more complex formula, it tends to um, amplify the qualities of the other elements in that formula and helps the the perfume persist on the skin longer than it would otherwise so it's said to to fix the aroma in a certain way and then uh, give it a longer life so it, it has uh, just lots and lots of different qualities that are that you simply can't uh, duplicate by synthesizing 
one or two molecules. You have to have the stuff. Taking a step back and and sort of looking at the book as a whole, it's incredibly wide ranging. It moves between um, between cultural topics, history, as you've said, chemistry, astronomy. When when you were starting to write it. Um, were there other books that you looked to or other authors that that you knew of who had been able to kind of tackle similarly broad topics? Uh, you know, I, I didn't really look for models of that sort. Uh, what I did look for were books that um, that really explored the 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 different facets of the subject in in a way that really intrigued me and mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of examples i'd love to give one is a, a perfumer by the name of roman kaiser who uh, uh, spent much of his career traveling around the planet with a chemical apparatus in his backpack taking samples of flowers and resins and soil and um, flowers uh, and bringing them back to his laboratory and analyzing them and then placing them in the context of the cultures of those places. And uh, uh, he's, he's just a master of, uh, of both um, aromatic science, but also of writing. He's very, um, uh, just very evocative and clear. And the title is Meaningful Sense Around the World. <laughs> the title the title says it all <laughs> two, uh, there are also two wonderful books by uh, a Canadian astrophysicist by the name of Hubert Reeves uh, one is called Atoms of Silence and the other is called The Hour of Our Delight and they are uh, an astrophysicist but I would say humanist perspective on the evolution of the universe and they're at this point maybe 20 30 years old so we've learned a lot about the universe since but the essence of both books is still um, uh, you know clear and and uh, beautiful your career focused on senses and taste and smell though know, emerged from a study in literature which you know, works well for us being in the book business. <laughs> Your scholarly work in literature was focused on Keats. Has is there any overlap between your your literary research and what became your your subsequent career in food and the senses? Well, there there is an accidental overlap, but I would say it's accidental. I'd love to be able to to uh, you know spin a, a, a terrific tale about it, but the I, I did write a dissertation about the poetry of John Keats, and because he died very young at the age of twenty five, um, I tried to cover his whole career and make sense of uh, how it developed. the The title of my dissertation was Keats and the Progress of Taste. Uh, taste in, in the literary sense, um, why he chose the subjects that he did at the turn of the 18th to the, to the 19th centuries. Um, but I'm afraid that's it. I, I certainly these days go back to Keats and especially enjoy the, the uh, you know, the sensory richness, especially the odes. Uh, but I'm afraid it was just an accident. You instruct the reader that they should jump into whichever chapter seems interesting to them and not try to push through the book from start to finish. Is that a principle that guided you in the writing of the book as well? Uh, no, no. I uh, realized very early on that I had to be systematic <laughs> in order to... <laughs> To make sense of things because there is simply so much information available nowadays uh i could have been you know a magpie for decades and never have been able to pull all the pieces together so i uh but i encourage people to to read like a magpie 
uh, because, uh, and I call the book a, a field guide, because I, I just hope that it'll illuminate those moments of experience and, and perhaps encourage those moments of experience when you're walking down the street and you notice a smell in the air that uh, for that moment strikes you. And um, oftentimes it's really interesting to figure out what it is. Um, so it's, uh, I, I think, a, a good principle for reading the book, but it would not have been a good principle for writing it. Harold, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Pleasure. I have been speaking with the food science writer, Harold McGee, author of the new book, Nose Dive, a field guide to the world's smells. Find it and the other books we talked about at kobo.com slash conversation, or click on the link in the show notes. You can find us and subscribe to the show wherever you're listening, and you can help other curious, book-loving listeners find us by rating and reviewing the show. Kobo and Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj and hosted by me, Michael Tamla. Thank you for listening.